welcome everyone that's joining still. Wait one more minute and then we will get started. Again, there is a poll on your screen. Please do fill that in. Awesome, Let, let's kick off anyway. So good morning, afternoon or evening folks, dependent on where you are in the world today. Um, this is actually the 17th version of our Women in DevOps webinar series since the pandemic. I'm really excited so we can get back in person as well. But today we'll be looking at the phenomena of site reliability engineering and how we can unlock operational efficiency. What you can expect is an hour of panel discussion with our speakers. We will have a live Q&A session at the end, followed by half an hour of virtual networking for those who wish to continue the conversation further. My name's Antonia Otter, and I'm the DAP founder of Women in DevOps and a principal DevOps recruiter at Trust in Soda. Personally, I'm extremely passionate about driving positive change within the tech industry and combating the diversity disparity that's not only prevalent in DevOps and SRE, but throughout the technology and engineering spaces. We're here to empower our people and ensure everyone's voices are heard. So you have me as your host and chair of today's webinar. Um, if you've not heard of Women in DevOps or been to one of our events before, we're a not-for-profit initiative devoted to empowering underrepresented voices within the DevOps industry, improving the gender imbalance and striving to promote equality in tech. We were formed to help break down barriers and, and drive positive change throughout the tech world. The story behind today's webinar is really to dig in a little bit deeper to what site reliability engineering actually is and how it may differ or align to what we typically know as DevOps and also see what our expert panel have to say about how they've implemented site reliability engineering best practices into their daily, daily business. We'll also touch on how our panel got into their roles as site reliability engineers and of course touch on diversity within the space as well. As always, questions are always welcome throughout the webinar. Please keep the conversation flowing within the comment box and we will answer all questions during the Q&A at the end. Uh, please note, before we kick off, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to our Women in DevOps YouTube channel where you can access our previous webinars and events as well. Um, this is absolutely enough from me. I would love to introduce our fabulous um, hosts or panelists to you now who are actually all based in Germany. Also love to know where our panelists are from. So please, if you pop in the comment box where you are, that would be awesome. But now let me hand over to our panel. If you could introduce yourself, your role, your key experience and anything that you're passionate about, that would be great. And Andrea, please, I'm gonna start with yourself. Hello, hello, good uh, good day everyone, uh, wherever you are. I'm Andrea, I'm currently working at Adidas for four and a half years. Um, currently I'm leading one of the SRE areas in Adidas e-commerce platform. So this area happens to be checkout and payments flow. So quite critical. And that's one of the main reasons why we started our journey to SRE almost two years ago. So I'm very happy to be here and share our learnings, also get some insights from all of you. And apart from DevOps, SRE, I love my two dogs. So <laughs> that's pretty much about me. Love that. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. I hope we all love dogs here. <laughs> yeah. <Amazing. laughs> cool. Let's pass on to Shay, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Shay. Originally, I'm coming from Iran, and I'm working for around six years uh, in Trivago. 
So um, we started the uh, DevOps around uh, 2018 at Girago at our team. Um, and now I have a son, a two-year-old one, and he is my passion at the moment. <laughs> Love that. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to be here. We're super happy to hear from you. Julia, you're next. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia. Uh, I have been working at Contentful for four years now. Um, I have been in the infrastructure slash DevOps space for about seven years. Uh, I don't know how long Contentful has been doing DevOps, I think, from the scratch. Um, and outside um, outside work, I am passionate about movies and inside work, I am passionate about how actually human interactions uh, impact products and processes and reliability and security and how to design for that, uh, like how to design systems in a way that they take the human element uh, into account. Amazing. And again, super happy to have you on board. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm from Hungary. Did I say that? I'm not sure. <laughs> but I love that. Thank you. Before we go super technical, you, you mentioned movies. Is there a favorite? There are too many favorites. <laughs> All right, we won't put you on the spot. Thank you. And finally, last but definitely not least, Gloria. Hi, everyone. My name is Gloria. I'm currently leading the SAE team at SoundCloud. And I've been in SoundCloud for roughly five years, going through different roles there and have a background in data engineering and was also an IC uh, on the SAE team before I started managing it. What I, what I like to do uh, in my free time and what I'm passionate about is um, climbing and uh, all kinds of sports. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, all of you. I'm super excited to hear all of your contributions. Um, so let, let's kick it off. I know I explained already at the beginning of the webinar and to all you folks specifically the reason for hosting this webinar and actually the reason for that tends to be because you hear all the time a lot of different interpretations to what site reliability actually means and how you can actually implement it within your job. So I'm very keen to hear from you all what SRE specifically means to you, both, I guess, personally and also in your role and in your career. And I don't want to pick on anyone to start. <laughs> I can start giving some some. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gloria. You have your hand. You're in mute. I'm just going to start uh, with um, like a quote of like Ben Trainer from Google in 2008. He was saying, "SAE is what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operation function." And I really uh, I like to quote that a lot when when I'm uh, explaining like what SAE is all about. And yeah, from that on. Uh, Andrea, please jump in. I would also uh, give some uh, insights from what Google says. It's like um, SRE implements DevOps. And at least for us at Adidas, it was a natural move. So we had the agile transformation, DevOps transformation, and then what happens after. And we start all the development, deploying too much to production. And then we don't have operations team uh, up to speed and ready to handle all that load and all that new, new stuff coming. So the natural uh, move would be having someone like what we call SRE now, someone in the team that is part of the team that is ready to, to take it um, whenever it's uh, production ready. So that's um, like the, the journey. Amazing. Thank you for that insight. Oh, Julia, we've got you on mute, I think. <laughs> that's true. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I have not read the SRE book from cover to cover, but uh, my entire experience as an infrastructure engineer comes from companies where they have a directly user facing product. In my current company, it is actually an API that is accessed programmatically. So in both companies, uptime and availability has been a key part of the product. And my understanding stems from that, that someone needs to be owning that 
part of the product be responsible for maintaining and improving it. So for me, SRE is simply that my success metric is really, really simple. It's our uptime. And whatever I'm doing around to like keep that up and improve it is what I'm what SRE is at the company. Amazing. Thank you for that. Shay, I can see your hand. Yes. So <laughs> So to me, first of all, SRE is a concept, is a mindset, actually. Um, I think everyone knows that the reason that DevOps or SRE concepts just came to the world was because of the silos. And they, they just wanted to break the silos and bring the teams more together and closer together. So for me, first of all, it's communication and care. I have two different experiences. We were um, actually our team was creating, was writing software for internal use for Trivago. Um, in the first team, it was a totally usual as normal DevOps team. It was, we had like uh, developers, we had operations and release, we had QA and one product owner. Uh, the team was working. Then I changed the team and I joined the new team, which was included of software developments, QA and product owner. Uh, the setup is a bit different. Software developers, they are doing from zero to hundred of development to um, all of the SRE concepts as well. I like this setup. And for me, it's really working the best. Um, it depends on the situations in different companies, but for us, it is really working because people care more about everything. They communicate faster. When something happens, they just, everyone just jumps in. And actually the conversations, the SRE conversations about adding like new metrics, more lagging, performance, um, all of them, they're happening earlier in the development cycle and not later. And that matters when your developers care more about reliability. Um, I think that's a good experience, at least for us, that was a good experience. Awesome, thank you. Gloria? Yes, so um, I mean, just like it, the question was also about like how we do um, implement that, right? And like, yes, uh, Google brought a book, uh, brought out a book, and everything is described really well, but it's not so easy to just take that and then implement that in any kind of company, right? So in our company uh, at SoundCloud, we only have one SAE team, not multiple teams or a team per feature or per product, right? So what uh, what's really important for us is like we're a team that brings um, all of engineering together, whether that's in like blameless postmortems, for example, um, or, or, or other kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, sessions where we're looking at, at systems like holistically. So that's like one of the things that's it's really important for us to like have this one team that brings everyone together. Thank yeah. you so much. Go on, Yulia. Uh, I, I would also uh, add that I think what SRE is, is really depends on the, the size of the company, the size of the product, the nature of the product, the kind of SRE Google needs, only Google needs that kind of SRE. Uh, and this is why you should not implement Google SRE in a 200, uh, 200 person company. So, but thinking about uh, what is the things you need? How much do they cost? At what point you should be investing in what? Uh, and how do you make these decisions? That is already an SRE uh, mindset, I would say. And I think we are all here working for fairly big companies. Now, maybe I'm at the smallest. So like we probably have very, very different uh, experiences of how SRE works in our companies. Amazing, thank you. No, you all make some some really awesome points. And yeah, I think that that's the beauty of SRE. It's moldable and it really depends on your own individual, your own company's needs as well. So amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, something I wanted to touch upon as well when we think about the phenomena of SRE, um, I think there's also quite a lot of potential misconceptions. What I personally find quite a lot, a lot on the market is the overlap of DevOps and SRE. Um, it's used quite interchangeably. Again, every company has a different interpretation. I'd be keen to hear from you folks specifically what misconceptions you might come across or what you think the difference between DevOps, software engineering, and SRE actually is? 
Go and share. <laughs> I can start as I have already explained a bit about this. So I am a live sample of all of these misconceptions. <laughs> so our team are software back and software developers, which are also doing SRE. And my title is DevOps. Just imagine how complicated it can be. <laughs> so my suggestion, don't get in trap of these namings. They are just names. You are all at the end computer engineers. That's the important one. And I know, actually, I, I actually know that in our company, we had some job applications opened as SRE engineer, but there were so less applicants that we changed the name to software engineering. So if someone wants to apply as SRE, just search for DevOps, search for Cloud, search for SRE, even software engineering, and just read through all the job, job requirements. It's not just SRE. It can be everything. You're right, actually. That's a very good point you make as well I think SRE as a job title is potentially not as common as software engineering but software engineering there's such a broad spectrum and I hear people who might be typically software engineers and they say oh I just moved into the operational part as well so you're right let's not get hung up on <laughs> job titles as well amazing um, Andrea go ahead yeah, the, for me, I think that there is a clear difference that would be a uh, DevOps is a, it's the mindset. So it's a set of practices. It's not an engineering and SRE, you have the E that's engineer. So it's actually an engineer job title and it's someone focusing in production, but I don't see SRE without DevOps practices. So at Adidas, as I said before, we went through this journey of DevOps transformation and now SRE uh, coming to, to the game to actually bring engineering to the operations part. What I see mostly is that our previous team members that before were doing more DevOps practices, and they are now also taking care of production. And this way it's easier to implement SRE, at least from my point of view and my experience, it's easier to implement SRE because you already have the engineering mindset uh, than the other way. So bringing operations people to do um, engineering. So the mindset um, change, um, gap, I would say, uh, it's uh, it's bigger. So from the experience that we've been having, um, having the engineers moving to production focus uh, is working better than the other way. Nice, interesting. Thank you for that input. Yulia? I also uh, see SRE, um, sorry, see DevOps to start first. Uh, it's basically this concept with the focus of enabling teams to own certain products or services entirely from designing it to actually running it and being on call for it and all the tooling and practices that go into that and inside that uh, aiming for reliability is a small subset but if you flip it then actually uh, devops is like the realm the terrain where sre works so the medium through which that reliability target uh, is achieved. Uh, but that is like really high concept things and job title wise, it's almost interchangeable. Also, I this I remember what I wanted to say. I think there is this, so I, I noticed that like the jobs that targeted me or that were interesting for me, the job titles changed over the last, I don't know, six years. But I think it also reflects a bit like how the bottleneck moves inside uh, the industry. So doing DevOps is just probably like easier now in a way than it was five years ago because there are more ready tools available. So that is not where you are focusing as a company because it is easier to get it done. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Gloria? Yeah, I think like um, the others have touched already about it, uh, on it that, it that the DevOps is a little bit more like what are we doing and SAE is how are we doing it? And I think there's a, the, these typical SAE practices that can come into play, like the blameless post-mortem, for example, or setting up SL, SLOs uh, and measuring SLIs and so on. So that's like much more practical on how do we actually achieve like, these, this philosophy. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I know that we're definitely going to touch on SLIs and SLOs later on. So I'm excited to hear about that. Um, so we've touched on this a little bit already as well. Um, yourself, Andrea, particularly, and it's how organizations can actually 
get started on their SRE transformations or their journeys? When is the right time? How do you go about implementing this? Who, what and why? I don't know who would like to give a little bit of insight onto this, but I'm keen to hear from you all. Yeah, I can I can I can take this one. Sure. So the when we started um, moving ahead with DevOps um, practices, we started, as I said, we started deploying a lot to production and we saw the need that we needed to have someone in the team that was ready. And then when it comes with SRE, it comes some of the practices. I don't know, should I go into the technical tech details then, um, Antonia? And then we if can... <laughs> you would like to, this is yeah, a good time. That Lucy. would be a good time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, please, can we have the background? Yeah, I really like uh, start uh, is now having like uh, tangible um, deliverables that you can actually start. And with SRE, I just want to share this picture to give, it's a very simplistic one, but it's a, a way to start. So with SRE, you come with some concepts, um, search level indicators, objectives, and neighbor budget. So in this example, it's a very simple API that happens to be in, in the flow that I, I'm currently working on. Um, but I just want to um, uh, share as an example how to start because there are some services in the market that what they can't, they do, they just plot in your system and they build uh, beautiful dashboards to senior management team and then you can present, but you can do it quite um, easily. And having, having said that, so we have this application, it's a simple API, it runs in Kubernetes, and we have this SLI uh, defined that will be availability. We have the SLO defined and our budget gives us like 0.5%. It's all aligned with the team, everybody knows, um, and all the, the consumers, they also know what are our targets. And then we have metrics, and in, in Adidas, we use Prometheus to scrape those metrics. And here in the middle, as you can see, is just a simple um, uh, math, uh, how to calculate the availability based on the uh, total amount of requests that failed, 5xx, over the total amount of requests overall. We use a time range of 30 days. So it means in, within 30 days, we can have 0.5% of um, 5xx in our uh, HTTP requests. So we have this data, it's a simple query um, from Prometheus. And okay, we, we do have this data, what do we do with that? We started with regulating releases. Um, there is a lot you can do, but we started with this and we use Jenkins. So we have this production pipeline uh, and whenever we're gonna deploy to production this API, this API, we have one stage that we'll check. If we have a whole budget, we simply go. If we don't have a whole budget, uh, we block. And whenever you block something, you need to explain why you are blocking. So that's why uh, on the top you see Grafana. We, we do have a dashboard that whenever it's blocked, um, whoever uh, is in the release uh, team or playing, uh, pressing the button to release can go to the dashboard, can see exactly uh, where are the endpoints that are not healthy. So the team can take some actions based on data. And uh, in the middle, I see um, I, I, there is this, uh, we send data to Prometheus via Pushkate because we don't want to see the data only right now. We want to see a trend. And we also build uh, another dashboard that gives you the trend when it was okay or not okay, when we had budget and not. So today, this is our um, working um, setup. But the ultimate goal is to start using error budget to alert. So not alert on a specific endpoints failures, but alert on error budget exhaustion. And uh, I mean, you were, you're done with your error budget. And that would be the ultimate goal as a necessary team. Yeah, if you have any question or anything, I'm happy to answer uh, either now or afterwards. But I, I wanted to bring this. Uh, it, it can be simple. You can start from, from a very small uh, API, a small setup, and then you can grow and use more SLIs and not only availability. But you need to start from, from something. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, that goes over my head, but Gloria, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for sharing, Andrea. I think like you touched on something super important, uh, which is like, that you need to buy in uh, from the whole business, right? Like if you want to like, you know, um, hold deploys because like a team has uh, has, has, has uh, spent their air budget, like, you know, you, you need to uh, have product people, for example, be okay with that and be like, okay, sure, yeah. 
that that makes sense like <laughs> we can't roll out anymore and then that's difficult sometimes because you know like uh, it's always a, a push like features need to be be finished quickly and rolled out and so on so that's like something that's really important to get buy-in from the business everyone needs to understand like why availability is important um yeah amazing thank you julia uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm coming from a bit different angle because my, my company does a product that is entirely user facing online. So uh, I, I think there wasn't a transformation, but what we are doing to uh, obtain availability has changed. So for example, those uh, metrics that you have built internally, there is contentfulstatus.com where you can see actually how we think are performing externally. So towards our clients, we have contractual SLAs and that I think is right now the primary thing that drives what we are doing behind the scenes. Um, there has been some reactive uh, stuff to uh, do SRE like, uh, like architecting automated failovers. And there has been some more like conceptual ones, for example, uh, um, defining service tiers. So to understand for about each service, how much, uh, how available they need to be. Um, and we, yeah, for example, error budget is not a tool that we use at this moment because we didn't need it, but monitoring availability on a service level, reviewing it regularly. So like increasing its visibility internally, even if in not an automated way yet, uh, is something that we are doing. And uh, like I said, the, what we are doing uh, for reliability has changed a lot because at times there was failovers and at times it's actually the reliability of the platform at times it's improving tooling it is very very multifaceted thank you so much for your insight it's really interesting to hear how different companies need to have different approaches to that as well was there anything else that anyone wanted to add about how to get started on your transformation yeah um i mean i think it's 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 great if you're able to like have slos uh, defined for every service but if that's not possible it's also great to just define like a general slo for the entire like company and 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 to start working with that um and even like if you if you don't have the buy in to to push through and like stop all deploys once you've like spent your air budget like you can still make people aware of it and like, you know, start creating some kind of um, yeah, aware, awareness uh, for, for, um, for availability. Awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect. Was there anything else anyone wanted to add? Awesome. Let um because oh, no, like, <laughs> I, I heard now about you know stopping deploys but i think like the effectiveness of stopping deploys or let me say the importance of stopping deploys i think it much depends on the speed and by which you can reward them because if you can very easily detect very quickly detect and and uh revert the deploy then you are risking a much smaller error amount uh, each time, but that is again a size and you know matureness of automation, etc. Thing. Yeah, I think like I, ideally, like you, you would see it as like a budget for experimentation, right? And so you only want to hold the deploys really when you've actually exhausted that budget fully, like and even went over it, right? So yeah, I mean definitely like slower, uh, slower deploys now. Uh, like, smaller deploys or like easier to revert deploys um, generally definitely uh, useful. Yeah, and, and, and the intention of blocking deployments is not really blocked just for the sake of blocking, but uh, for the sake of uh, let's prioritize um, uh, technical depths or whatever is uh, to improve the reliability of the system. So that's just a number we have to agree with and uh, the business know. So then we can push a bit more to have stability and not features, 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 uh, if we are not in a healthy state. Amazing. Thank you so much for all of your input there. 
Cool. Let's move move on um, slightly a little bit. Um, I personally have quite a lot of conversations with people, not only around what SRE is, but actually, and I know we've touched on this already, <laughs> um, SRE is not necessarily always a job title. It can be software engineering. It can be DevOps as well. But I'd be really keen to hear about all of your own personal journeys to what to getting into SRE and if you have any tips for our audience on how they can get there themselves or any specific pathways you think that they should go down as well. Laurie, you start. <laughs> sure, I, I can start. Um, I mean, generally, I think there is not like one um, specific path. I don't think there is a, a degree by now that's SAE. Um, maybe there is, I don't know. But uh, I mean, for me personally, I, I had never heard about SAE. Um, I had never heard about, uh, you know, specific infrastructure roles until like I got into them really, right? So I, I started in, 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 in engineering and data engineering and like, kind of discovered my my liking for for infrastructure and for distributed systems and general systems uh, systems um, as a whole and 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 kind of like found out that I'm really in uh, into that and uh, you know once um, once you are in a company where you you might have uh, an easier way to switch into different teams and try out different things and um, uh, I had uh, gotten actually a mentor from an SAE team um, who worked with me um, on understanding specific things there and, you know, um, yeah, just uh, learning more about um, like infrastructure, about Prometheus, about Grafana, about uh, Kubernetes and so on. And kind of my, my interest led, uh, led that path. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely um, a possibility no matter where you are even if you're not an engineering yet like if you follow your interests like you can find your way to SAE. Thank you so much for that input I'm going to put you on the spot here um, as well I hope you don't mind <laughs> I don't know if there are any like tools or technologies that you may um, suggest an engineer and an inspiring engineer to get to grips with or have a look at if SRE is their desired career path as well. Sure, I mean, there is a lot, but I've, I've mentioned a few, like, I mean, Kubernetes is something you will not get uh, get uh, past. Uh, and there's um, Prometheus and Grafana, which are great uh, for monitoring. So these are like some good things to, to, to start with. There's also Terraform um, that you should take a look at um, to, to, to learn how to um, bring up infrastructure uh, with code. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a long list. <laughs> any kind of systems, uh, just nerd yourself into systems. Amazing, thank you so much. I've got both Yulia and Shay with your hands up. I'm not sure if one of you wanted to ask first. Go on, Shay. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so um, about your question, let me tell you my own story for the path, for the pathway that people could take. So I started as a student at IT support in Trivago. Uh, then the team grew and uh, the team changed the role to, it was responsible for internal server, server administrator and some software. So I got to the role of server administration and um, getting the, I got my MCSA and then the team, ch I changed the team again to a software development team as operations and release engineering. Then I got involved and actually I knew at that moment about agile concepts, about cloud, CICD, monitoring tools, deployment, configuration tools, and etc. And I had to leave for one year for parental leave. And I did not know if I will come back. I was not sure at that moment what will happen when I come back. Is my position is still there? Is my team is still there? Is the company is still there? What will happen in a year? Um, I was so doubtful. But then after a year, I, was, uh, I wanted to go back. And then uh, my previous team did not exist anymore. And I had to join a new team. And I was just in a position that I was like, I was sad and I was thinking of all of those questions that why as a woman, my career life should be like so much affected when I decided to become a mom. If I ever can uh, do what I like to, to do as a career, if I can grow in my career ever again and all of those kinds of questions. But I had to start from somewhere. So um, they offered me to start as a backend developer in a new team. And I was like, have you ever seen my CV? 
is there any software development in that one? What do you think? <laughs> but uh, the, my team lead told that um, with your knowledge and experience from before and uh, from the infrastructure side, I am sure you can do that. You have to just learn software development. I was like, okay, thank you, easy. But anyway, I started. And it turned out the team was actually a DevOps development team. And uh, it wasn't just about backend software team. And I am happy now with this setup. So my suggestion would be embrace the changes and don't be afraid of unknowns. They are sometimes good. It's not like that every day you would just wake up and say, yay, I'm going to go to work. No, there are sometimes also frustration days. There are also sometimes the days just it's an incident happens, something is down and you just want to bang your head against the wall. But uh, the point is that when you look before and you look like, like a long term, you look what has happened in the long term, in six months or in a year, you have to feel happy about what have you have done in this period. And at the end, there isn't, there isn't any same pathway for anyone. Just to start from somewhere, at least the people who are here, it means that they are in the correct way, I can say. <laughs> Uh, but uh, one point is that important. If you want to go in this way and if you want to start a new company, then ask about the culture of the company enough. If they are adopting new technology, if they already have DevOps concepts, if um, they will give you opportunity to learn, if they will give you opportunity to grow, if they will give you this opportunity to experiment different stuff. And um, if, if they will empower you in this way, ask enough questions to get a feeling of this of their culture it isn't just them they have to ask you no you have to also feel where you are going so that would be my suggestions for everyone who wants to go in this path thank you so much for input shay i said it the first time i heard your journey i absolutely love it and it's testament for who you work for that you get the opportunity to move and even if it was unexpected you think of the growth and you love it now so thank you so yeah, much julia <laughs> yeah. i know that you had your hand up beforehand so i have um maybe a bit unusual but very short story into devops and sre i got hired as a general engineer into a company that was cool and put into that team. And this was the first time I heard about like the entire problem set really of infrastructure, reliability, monitoring. I didn't know, you know, which end head or tail of make of that, but I just really loved it. Uh, so it just clicked. So the experimentation in my, my case was switching companies from time to time and, and, and be conscious about that. But also, I think how people in general get into SREs is also changing a lot because my colleagues five, six, seven years ago were people who were previously classical system operators, you know, managing servers in cellars and, and uh, in basements and, and having a lot of cables hanging around a lot and now I have a very junior colleague who's coming from straight from university and she already got interested in Kubernetes in university probably at the same time I learned about Kubernetes on my job uh, and also I think like five years ago if you were you know fresh into tech maybe a career changer you would probably learn front-end engineering first like maybe one of those online courses and uh now it would be a boot camp and it's like sort of a bit far but if on the other hand if you ever done a jungle girls course it's immediately starting to deploy to heroku and once you deploy to heroku you already need to operate it you already get a taste of the kind of problems that you need to deploy you need to understand whether it's running how do you know it's running so like i think like the way is like how long it is to get into sre or how how far it is from the easy entry points into IT is changing. I really hope it's getting, um, really hope it's like getting uh, shorter. But one thing I would be aware of, and this is something a very esteemed colleague of mine told me that some problems only occur at some scales. Like there's some part of SRE that you would really only uh, get exposed to professionally if you work for a big enough company. Uh, but, you know, playing with Kubernetes clusters, you can do at the, at the comfort of your home. Awesome. Thank you. And you are right. I'm definitely seeing accessibility into site reliability engineering becoming 
a lot more accessible and it's the awareness over DevOps and SRE and what it actually is and people going straight into it now as juniors instead of coming from that systems or that software engineering background that we would typically see a few years ago um, as well. Andrea, not to pick on you, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add to this point or we will move on. <laughs> Yeah, we can move on. I think they already covered uh, most of what I would say as well. So, okay. oh, good. <laughs> Superstar. So I've got one last question for you all, and then we're going to move on to the Q&A. I know we've got quite a few questions that have come up in there, but obviously th this is women in DevOps, women in SRE. We can't go without discussing the diversity disparity within DevOps. I know we are all women here. I'm not an engineer, so I can't take any credit. But within Germany, um, the percentage of engineers who are women or um, who are women is sits at only 11%. So what do you folks think we can do to positively affect this? Or why do you think that may be as well? Gloria, go on. I, suppose, I suppose we're already doing something uh, with this event. I mean, like just like you know, showing the uh, what 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 SA is and and you know like the, what we're doing and that it's fun and that it's cool and that it's not a, a thing for just like white uh, old uh, men uh, to do. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. But it also um, at SoundCloud, I um, recently uh, hired a trainee. And uh, I decided to, to open the role only for diverse candidates um, to also, you know, give them a chance. And uh, especially uh, focused on, uh, on 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 people who don't have experience yet and who don't know about SAE yet, but are interested. And we did that by really like focusing on uh, on 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 you know potential uh, rather than experience. So we're checking: are they resilient? How do they handle stress? Like, can they learn from failure? Um, how do they communicate, you know, all of these things, like even like, how do they troubleshoot? Like, would they be able to, you know, like in an incident, you know, like figure out, uh, you know, how, uh, why, how and why the system is broken or, the, or better how to fix it quickly. Yeah, so that's uh, one kind of small success story um, from SoundCloud. We hired someone uh, this year, a young woman, she's doing great. Um, and she's really like loving it and had never heard about SAE. So yeah. I love that. <laughs> we, I'm so happy to hear that um, as well that you went for those methods. I have this conversation all the time. I, I don't necessarily think you need to have a technical background. It's about your personal attributes and anything can be learned. So that is amazing. Was it Shay or Andre who had your hand up first? Was it, I think Shay? Yeah. What about Shay? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. um, so um, uh, I think. SRE basically it's a it's a really wide field. I mean, if you want to go there, you have to know many different tools and applications, and you have you should have a long experience. So usually the job applications, job criteria, qualification requirements, usually they are mentioned so many different stuff. So maybe women they are more logical and they are more rational as, as men. When they see, for example, they can fulfill like one to three out of six, they say, okay, no, I will be rejected, so I won't apply. But men, they just apply. They don't care about it. I mean, but they will, they will think, okay, what will happen at the worst case? I will be rejected. But women are not like that. Maybe that's the reason. And but I would say, if if you see like you are fulfilling like half of them, just just do that because maybe if hundred percent they have applied and maybe they all of them they can just one to one they can do just one then two and you are the only person who can do one to three. So don't be afraid. Yeah, there, there are statistics about that um, as well. You might have seen me roll my eyes. Sorry, that was a recruit in me when you mentioned about this long list of tools and technologies that you must have written on the job description because it's the bane of my life actually digging in deeper to what is an actual must have and what's nice to have because 80% of those tools and technologies tend to be a nice to have um, as well but you're right and I think that also sits down a little bit to the company there have been studies that, that do show that yeah typically people that are men will apply even if they don't fit all of the prerequisites but as a woman you might have to feel you fit 60 to 70 percent of the wants on the job description 
description as well. Um, something that I always suggest to companies to do is have a disclaimer at the bottom. This is just an ideality. This is the tech stack we use. If they are really passionate and really believe in building diverse teams, actually you're going to be looking at the individual as the individual and how they can learn, not just, oh yeah, yeah, you've worked with that tool and technology. So that is a great point to add as well. Andrea, you are next. <laughs> yeah, so apart from what you just said that uh, I think it's a bigger, even a bigger topic, not only SRE, it's a whole IT word, uh, but what helps is to demystify this, what is SRE. So uh, it's nothing but a different engineering. So you're just focusing in production. It's, it, but one thing that I think, uh, it might affect also is the on-call support because it might be that you need to be 24 for seven available work at night. So um, for some cultural reasons, uh, we do have these problems, uh, but what is helping at least at Adidas, uh, we, we have a hiring panel and in the hiring panel I'm part of, we have some other women part of. So we try to make more comfortable for other women to come in and talk not only to men, but also to women. And we try to speak about it and say, so we have this area, we work as an engineer and it's fine. It's someone that is nothing uh, super complex that uh, someone cannot do. Yeah, I, I think it's helping. So we are proactively approaching women. As I said, most of them say, oh, but maybe I will not fit in. But whenever we proactively approach them, uh, they sometimes are okay. And we just have a conversation and it might end up in a good hiding. So just need to, to unclear the the blurry <laughs> of SRE. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. It's not too scary as well. And exactly. Great, yeah, and it's great to hear as well that you've got a good representation within your panel. And I think what you said about on-call as well, that, that affects all working parents, right? So actually what companies need to be implementing is some sort of flexibility perhaps for on-call rotors as well. But Let's see how things go. Thank you so much for your input. I think, Yulia, you are next, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Uh, I'll just take it. <laughs> um, things that these are all like I agree with so much with everything that you have said. What I would uh, like to add is that I see like infrastructure teams and security teams as sort of like gravitational centers, so often professionals. Uh, from other ends of engineering sort of gravitate towards this area. And, and that is something we could make use of uh, for the already existing uh, women in all of, well, at 11 person, which is, by the way, I think is fantastic. When I first looked, it was five. So for me, 11 is like, hooray. Um, and the other, the other thing is really investing in, in uh, teaching people, growing people internally, be it hiring juniors or you know, even getting people fresh, fresh out of start at their career and see if it works for them. Because I do not know any model of for growing reliability engineers or DevOps engineers other than training on the job and like every I think we all like personally and companies need to invest in, in training the next generation of professionals uh, they want to hire. And also I would, this is just like in general, but inclusion and an inclusive uh, culture all throughout the company is what helps keeping any kind of diversity uh, on the job and in the company specifically, of course, but this is a common place. Thousand percent correct. And I do generally believe it is a top down approach of having a very open and safe culture where underrepresented voices feel safe as well. And you're right, training, that's the only way we're gonna positively affect is education. DevOps and SRE is cool. I always speak about myself. I'm not that cool. I'm a recruiter. If I look back to when I was 16 and I knew what DevOps and SRE was, I would definitely have tried to go down that path. Now I'm 25 and I'm like, hmm, it's not too late, <laughs> but I like my job, so <laughs> I won't be doing it. It's not but... too late. <laughs> I know. I'm not sure I've got the brain capacity, but let, let's see. Um, I need to stop talking. Gloria, you're <laughs> it's, it's never too late, right? 
but um, I mean, just like, I mean, some, some practical advice maybe from my side for someone who would like to get into SAE. And I think there's, uh, it's, it's very easy. Like there's the SAE book from uh, Google. It's available online. You don't even have to buy it. Like you can just go for it, read it. And like, you probably know more than most people about SAE. I, it's it's that it's that simple. And if if you if you if you've read that and if you understand that say twenty or thirty percent of it, and you go uh, <laughs> to to the team in the company, they probably already want to hire you. I mean that's uh, that's that's motivation and that's like really like you know um, showing that you have great interest and then that's also really important on the job. Or write that in your application, like understand uh, understand uh, or, or show in your application what you have understood about SAE and how it makes a company better um yeah so love that. activity yep amazing awesome Shay I don't want to pick on you but I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add in the end to that point if not it's absolutely fine no just totally agree with everyone read the books learn the application, learn the tools, and then start from somewhere. Don't just wait too too much. Just a start. <laughs> Speak to us here. You please. should yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't be perfect to just get hired somewhere. Just to start from somewhere. Don't wait too much. Amazing. Thank you so much all for that input. So there are a couple of questions that have come up in the QA. A couple have been answered, I believe, but there's definitely three that have been um unanswered and one of them I don't know if you folks will know the answers I personally don't but one of them says do you know the reason why DevOps is still not covered enough in most universities maybe it's too new but I'm not an expert <laughs> I only have a I only have a bet but I think th this is a general observation university course materials are really slow to change, much, much slow, slower to change uh, than, than the actual technologies. When I was in university, that was like more than 10 years ago, I remember only one course when we had to work in a team at all. The rest was programming alone. How is that? Like, it has nothing to do with how I do my job today. That was, and only, only in that course did they ask us to, re, to use version control. Like, so yeah. I think it's just like universities are, are uh, struggling to keep up, but I have no idea how a university today in Germany looks like. If there's someone in the audience, maybe they can, they can uh, tell. Uh, I do hear the same thing as you say, Yulia, just not up to date with what's going on. It's not quick enough to, to keep up with tech basically as well. Oops, we've answered that one live. Awesome. Anything else for anyone to add there? Perfect. Okay. Oh, sorry, Gloria, go on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, honestly, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I studied mathematics in, in, in university and I've learned to like solve problems and like think and whatever, but like everything else I've learned on the job. So yeah. I think, I feel like that's, it's, it's, yeah, just normal that you don't really learn in university what you need in, a, in business, right? <laughs> Question for you. I'm very keen to hear your answers. Um, do you think degrees are necessary for success within engineering? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely not. Definitely it's not. a no-go. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, Yulia, we've got you on mute. Yeah. Sorry. Again. I think absolutely not. On the other hand, the most of the successful people I have seen who have been very successful without engineering degrees are a sort of prodigies who, you know, which is wonderful to have, but is simply not available to anyone who is not super genius. Or B, they had a degree or at least some kind of in-depth knowledge in something else. So that there is a kind of skill set I think that you get mostly in higher education or different kinds of higher educations in the world, most people get it there. And it, I think it like really doesn't matter if it's comparative literature, linguistics, astrology, astronomy or whatever, but like 
the, the way of, of approaching problems, a way of understanding complex things, this and communication and whatever. So a bunch of skills are needed that are usually obtained while working towards a degree. I must add that like some of the uh, strongest engineers I know, they don't have degrees and they usually, it went like they they did go to university, but they started working somewhere and realized they're learning much faster and much more on the job and just like dropped university and yeah. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting point. I'm happy to say that I have not come across any companies that require an engineering degree anymore for their DevOps or SRE roles. And I'm glad because it's just a barrier to entry, in my opinion. And maybe it gives you a nice foundation. You probably don't need it. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, the, the, only, the only person that has ever like, wanted to see my degree from university was my mom. <laughs> as long as it's stuff on the wall. <laughs> Amazing. Any other points to that? No, but um, just one is, is more one. Whenever, if you start growing and growing, I think and it's not only on tech side, but also on communication skills. So, uh, and you, you don't learn that on university, right? So you, you might learn something, but uh, you have to learn on the fly. And there are some small courses that you can like here and there, how to have your mindset, uh, proper mindset, or how to better communicate and so on, but not a uni degree <laughs> that will make the difference. It's all about putting it in practice. <laughs> Go on, Shay and or Yulia. Yeah, exactly. This uh, the most important skills like communication, problem solving skills. They, you wouldn't learn that in university. Um, so, and but from what I see also in my workplace, it isn't also that much important. But when you are learning something, you have to learn it in depth. You have to learn it properly, not just uh, cherry picking and just some, something from here, something from there. And you learn it in depth when you learn it uh, from the theories, basics, and most, most important basics, then you are good to go. You don't need really a degree. Exactly that. Julia? Uh, I think this is also like a sign of how how the, the sorry the sign of change in how we are learning because 15 years ago when I pivoted towards engineering the way to do it was to go to another university but if, had I done it five years ago I would have just gotten to a boot camp well maybe three years ago I would have gotten to a boot camp but there were no boot camps uh 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and there were also no online trainings and there were no support groups and GitHub communities and, and whatnot. So it's, um, it's, it's like asking for a degree is like an old remnant and, but it was very valid for a long time, what I'm saying, just not anymore. I'm wondering actually, is there any DevOps or SIE bootcamps? Cause I haven't heard any yet. Um, I think boot camps are targeting people who are most boot camps who are only really starting out and only learning to code. Uh, so um, I think it's like a very different target audience. I think as well that links a little bit to the barriers of like getting diversity within SRE because you're right, you look at boot camps and it's front end or back end engineering. Maybe you'll touch a tiny bit on the infrastructure, but actually that that's not necessarily what we would call devops and sra and it's that education and accessibility piece coming in again i actually don't know i know of a brazilian company who have devops boot camps but in europe and you actually see better diversity in brazil than you do in central europe as well i actually don't know if i've seen one i'm going to do some research on that after um but yeah you're right Okay, we've got another question come through the Q&A and it's, I've just started line managing site reliability engineers. What would you say the best way to start to better understand what they do and how to help them grow in their roles? And it says to add, I'm not from an engineering background, but was a software tester previously. So I'm a complete novice. Uh, 
I think Gloria touched it on the, like read the book, the basics of SRE. So you know a little bit what it means, but also try to understand in your company what SRE means. Because for me, it Adidas, it means one thing. It might be that in different companies, it means a different thing. So try to understand where are the targets and how then you can better help them. But having a good understanding, at least of what SRE means in theory, will help definitely. Awesome, thank you. You're, you're right. What does SRE mean for your company <laughs> as well? <laughs> True, because it's different. Yeah, we have like uh, endless conversations in yeah. what does it mean uh, for us, SRE, because it's different. As for us, we do have DevOps, but some companies, uh, there is a specific people working only on production and they don't necessarily work on CICD. So it might differ. It might yeah. differ. That's very true. Awesome, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has anything they would like to add to best understand what SREs do and help them grow in their roles. Cool, let's move on. Um, a question says, how do you manage strategic work in your teams in order to eliminate the toils? Oh, and Yulia. Yeah, well, for some, this is, I guess it's an ongoing problem for everyone. We are starting measuring it. And then, uh, and then we can say, then we can build projects on it saying we are going to, you know, reduce the work spent on this by this, how much, and this is engineering hours. Like, I guess this is a simple approach, but this is uh, something we could do. Amazing. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Cool. Perfect. So to be quite honest with you, we are actually at time. That's not the end. Um, <laughs> we do have an extra 20 minutes left for virtual networking. If you have a look in the chat box, Lucy has put a link um, for virtual networking. If you've got any questions that you would like to ask our panel um, please jump on with us as well but all I want to say is a massive thank you to our speakers here today you've been incredible I'm super thankful that you've spent your evening with us as well and also to our audience thank you so much for the questions that you've asked as well so yeah please come and join us on the virtual networking as well um, at Women in DevOps, we are super passionate to improving the diversity disparity, not only within DevOps, but within the whole tech and engineering space. So thank you so much for coming on with us today and supporting one another as well. If you have any questions for myself or any of the panelists, jump onto the networking or please speak to us on LinkedIn. I'm sure the panelists are happy to speak to you too. I've just said that for them. Um, I'm super open to that as well. But otherwise, please come on to networking and we will see you shortly.